Welcome to the Affair Parent Podcast. My name is Cindy Taylor. I'm one of the co-founders here at Affair Care, along with my dear hubby David, who is the man behind the camera. This week we are continuing the Refresh series. This week we're going to be continuing our series with the four things to do when you just find out. As in everything with our refresh of the website, we're also refreshing the things that you can do today when, to save your marriage when you just find out. Before I proceed any further, one thing I will point out is that one thing you can do is on our website we have up in the navigation bar uh, the Just Found Out tab. And if you click on there, you can sign up for our newsletter. And uh, in our newsletter, we do include uh, tips and uh, helpful things to help you recover after an affair. Our goal is to help you become obedient to God and reconcile your marriage. But in the event that your spouse, let's say, is is an unbeliever and they choose to go, we will still help you recover uh, personally afterward, whether they choose to stay or not. You can do that. That's just an option that's out there. And I'll uh, include a link there to our our Just Found Out page. That will be right here. (laughs) Dear hubby David will add that for me. (laughs) Okay. And then, um, Another thing you can do is we do have some various articles. I suggest maybe you know go to the site and search, and then uh, you'll uh, maybe search for just found out, and you there are some articles and blogs and things that that maybe have helped you. One of the things that I did want to talk about this today is the idea that disloyal spouses often will say this that you know disloyal spouses hurt too, and who hurts more, the loyal or the disloyal, and you know there's kind of that discussion going on. I would say in an affair situation, it's, it is true that both spouses do hurt and both spouses have experienced uh, hurtful things that, you know, contributed to this situation. But one thing that I did want to um, kind of start with is that, you know, uh, dear hubby and I took classes to become uh, nothetic counselors in addition to just being marriage coaches. We were taking a class and it was uh, given by a man who was a law enforcement uh, chaplain. And his particular class was about um, how to tell if it's an urgent situation and kind of what to expect. So for example, in the event of like a, a, a trauma or a crisis, the person might, after they hear this traumatic news, they might um, you know, appear disoriented or they might become kind of confused. They might become hypersensitive. They might uh, have poor concentration. They might shake or shiver. So some of the things, so we kind of know um, what to expect a little bit. Um, And during the class, I heard an example that was so close to what it feels like to, you know, you know, when you finally actually discover that your spouse is, uh, is unfaithful that I, I wanted to just share that with you. And it's, it is like a parable. So you have a 17 a year old, you love your 17 year old, and they go and get their driver license and they ask you for the car keys to go to the football game. And you think to yourself, well, it, they're a mature kid and it's just a football game. They're gonna meet some friends, you know, it seems pretty reasonable. So you you give them the car keys, uh, they don't plan to go out afterwards, you know, nothing seems untoward, so you trust them and you give them the keys. Um, and so um, one day he calls and, and he's like, uh, well, there's been a little fender bender. And you, part of your heart gets scared, right? Uh, nobody's injured, information's been exchanged, there's a small ding in the trust, but um, uh, it it is urgent, but he took care of it, and um, you know it's a small day. Okay, another time uh, there has been an actual accident, and this time uh, your seventeen year old uh, was was part of the accident. Um, he broke his leg, and the other driver was at fault. This is again, it's an emergency, and it's serious, but all things considered, it's an accident. Um, There's not a ding in trust on that one because there's nothing the child could do. It was an accident. But then um, there there comes the day when you give them the keys. He says, I'll be home. You know, 2 a.m. rolls around, 3 a.m. rolls around, not answering their cell phone, and you're worried to death. At 3 a.m., you get a knock on the door, and there's two uniformed 
uh, officers. Uh, one has a chaplain's badge on the porch, and you know. And at that moment right there, that's what it's like to find out that your spouse has been cheating. That immediate you know, scream of no in your mind and the world dropping out from under your feet. Everything that you loved and lived for is dead and there's like initial numbness and disbelief and then that's quickly overshadowed with the, the, the feeling of hopelessness and loss. For a while the loyal spouse has likely suspected um, but hasn't been able to prove it. But when you get that that proof that's like, I can't, you can't deny it anymore, there's definitely an affair. That's very similar to that moment of the knock on the door, two police officers, and uh, hearing that news. In fact, um, in the course of our experience with affair care, um, people have said, the loyal spouses have said, that the pain of hearing that your spouse is having an affair uh, is greater than a spouse dying or a child dying. And uh, having been there myself in the sense of, uh, you know, having had a, a spouse that was uh, cheating on me, I would have to agree that, that so far in my life there's been no greater pain than, uh, than discovering that. Um, so, next time you're thinking, well, I know that you hurt, but I also hurt. Just remember, that the, the two uniformed officers at the door. That is what it's like to just find out. So, when you're in that situation and you've just found out, uh, one thing to recognize is that it is, uh, you know, an, an, I call them, it's a, tr it's a trauma crisis because it just shakes you up so badly, okay? So the, the first thing we honestly do suggest is don't be in a rush. Um, Right now, if you try, I tr personally believe when your emotions take over like that, that it's very, very difficult and very unlikely that you'll be thinking at all, <laughs> and you surely won't be thinking clearly. So um, the first thing you could probably do for yourself is don't make a decision right now. Don't be in a rush to, to decide what to do or make some choice that, you know, later you'll regret. So... You know, you, you may hear people like say stuff like, get a hold of yourself, take some deep breaths. A lot of that stuff may not work, but f o over the course of, a, of several days or maybe a week or so, it may take you that long, you know, to sort of, after hearing the news, take some time. Do practice deliberately with some deep breathing. Uh, walk or take a run or whatever you do just to take some time to get to the point where you are kind of a hold of yourself, if you will. Um, we, uh, this is part of our refresh. There's uh, two things that we suggest uh, that you do like immediately. One would be to schedule an appointment with your doctor. This is your regular general practitioner doctor. You will probably want to talk to the, your doctor about uh, STD testing because despite what your disloyal may have told you, let's just say that it's wiser to be sure and have the test. Now it may be embarrassing and it's better to be embarrassed and alive and to catch it in time if there is a, a disease than to have your ego intact but be dead because you didn't know that you have HIV now. So tell your doctor why you need the test. Uh, tell your doctor uh, like where you're at. It is likely they will try to prescribe you antidepressants and in this is my own personal opinion and I believe the opinion of, of you know David as well here at Affair Care, don't jump on the pill crutch, okay? Now, that's not to say that after some consideration you may choose to do that, but rather often people think, I need this pill to make me happy, you know? And in real life, you've just found out your spouse is unfaithful, you're not going to be happy. And it's reasonable to not be happy at the moment. It's a, a situational sadness, and that's okay. So experience that. But also, if you do decide that you want some uh, assistance, which sometimes that happens, um, you might want to try natural assistance first rather than jumping straight onto a pill. So for example, you may want to try talking to friends first. You may want to try an herb first. And then if those things are inappropriate, in consolidation with your doctor, 
you could consider a pill. Don't jump on the pill. Okay, next thing that you really need to do is to open your Bible. Now, I'm addressing you as, as if you, I'm assuming that you are Christian, meaning that um, you recognize that you are a sinner, that uh, you don't have uh, access, <laughs> because of your sin, you don't have access to a holy God, but that Jesus Christ came to earth and uh, died in your place, and that that's where your faith is, that my faith is in his death. And because of that, you're reconciled to the Holy God, and he sees you as his child, okay? So we're assuming that. If that's the case, then everything we've, you know, the, you know go to the doctor and stuff, those things are, uh, uh, you know, take a moment and get, get yourself together. Those things are kind of relying on your internal strength. And I'm going to just tell you right now that that is not where you want to start. Um, you want to, it's not going to be enough because, uh, the, the, the human strength, you can easily let yourself down, you can easily make mistakes, but you, as a Christian, you have a source of unending strength, compassion, and healing at your fingertips, and that's the Holy Spirit. Okay, God promises to be there, and He is the Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. He cannot break His promises. Um, so, what He promises, He does. So, probably the best thing you can do right now. Step away from everything else, find a quiet place, open your Bible, and start reminding yourself of the promises God has made to be with you. Don't fear that he, he will support you. Okay? All of those things are found in God's Word. So right now, I'd recommend reading the Psalms. Psalms are great. They're very comforting. Um, it's it's a, a good spot to start and to restart remind you that your hope is with with God. You, you can find it in the Bible, and your hope is with God via the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's the first part. Don't be in a rush. Give yourself some time. The second thing that you can do is to take responsibility for your part of what occurred. And right about here, most people say to me, Whoa, what do you mean? Are you, are you trying to tell me that my spouse cheated on me because of something I did? I'm supposed to take responsibility for that? I'm not saying that your spouse's infidelity is anything to do, is, is, they made that choice, that's on them, that's their responsibility, okay? But rather, what I meant was, you cannot change your spouse. The change that's going to occur will be within you via the changing power of the Holy Spirit. So what you do is you look at yourself and you be honest. Kind of like, look at the man in the mirror and be honest. Don't accept their blame, don't accept their excuses, but for the things that you did do, be responsible for them. If you actually were absent a lot, take responsibility for that and putting a plan together how you can change. You could have chosen to do other things, right? So what can you do? We're all human, we all make bad mistakes, and usually the things that you, you might take a real responsibility for would be um, you were away too often, left maybe left them alone. Um, or another thing that is really common is anger issues. And if you are a person who's easily, you like you say unto you, I'm not angry, I'm frustrated. That's anger, <laughs> right? If this is something that you, if you are speaking with your spouse in a tone that's not loving, encouraging, and wow, I love to be with you, you might have an anger issue. Just look at your own self. And if, and then, that's where you need to focus your work. Don't be worried about them. They're going to have enough problems with their infidelity, and we will talk with them about their part. You need to worry about your part. Does that make sense? So that's where we're trying to say, disconnect yourself from what their issues are and start focusing on your issues. Okay, the third uh, good thing you can do is, we call it do a 180 turn from what you've been doing, the U-turn, okay? And here's why. What you've been doing is not working, and it has led to infidelity. <laughs> now, um, do you remember on the Seinfeld a show where it was G George <laughs> realized that he was doing everything wrong, and if he did everything exactly the backwards of what he kind of like his, his initial instinct, he was like attracting women left and right, and it was kind of a little joke, right? But in real life, what we're saying is actually kind of similar. If what you're doing has not been working, then stop doing that 
and do something different. Okay, your initial instinct uh, will probably deceive you, and your initial instincts are probably one of two things. One would be to rage and scream and yell at your spouse for for their cheating, or the other would be to beg. You lose your your respect, and you're saying to yourself, "Please come back," and you're uh, you know begging them. Begging is not attractive. So both of those initial instincts are are incorrect. And what you want to do is sort of assess yourself and don't promise that you're going to change. Don't these things are going to be driving a wedge. And instead, you want to look at your spouse yourself and start to say, what can I do that would just improve me as a person and as a parent? I may be parenting alone, so I want to become a better parent. And you can place some of your uh, efforts in that route. And, and then finally, your home is the marital home. Where the children live is the marital home. The resources that you bring of, via your work of a, are to support the marital home. And if your spouse wants to leave, you can't stop them, but you don't need to give them resources from the marital home. So you just do your best to stand for the marriage, to stand for the marital home, and to be a better parent. Do a 180 turn from what you've been doing via your study in the Bible, allow the Holy Spirit to change you from within. Okay, so then the last thing we would recommend is to get advice from an expert. Now, we're not saying that you have to come and talk to us. You may have an expert right there in your own hometown. You, it may be that your parent is someone who is an expert, but what you want to find is somebody, usually somebody in your church, who is pro-marriage, you're not trying to get some people on your side, but you want to get, or some, you know, people who are yes men who are going to say, oh, your, your spouse is terrible. You want somebody who will tell you the truth, but who is going to be supportive of you? So you're going to want to search that person out. Again, it's it's likely a pastor, possibly a, a, a parent, or a professional mentor, or somebody like that, who is going to give you wise counsel, good advice. And yeah, if you want to come talk to us, that would be great. As a matter of fact, if you want to reach us, you can email us at affaircare at gmail.com. Uh, you can also come on in our site and make you know comments on the blog or on the uh, YouTube channel, and we would be happy to be in touch with you uh, via email, or uh, we can arrange a phone call. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. Next week, we'll be finishing the series that we're doing, and we will be talking about the steps that you can take to save your marriage. Now, now that we're a little bit past just finding out, what can you do next? So, see you next week. <laughs> Bye-bye.